Good morning, everybody. Um, Doug, um, I'm taking over right now. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see you, so we're, so we're going. Uh, this is what uh, we've all been waiting for, a year's worth of blood, sweat, and tears. Everything comes down to one big Zoom uh, presentation, so uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Ed Hernandez, one of the master teachers. Uh, Doug Scott uh, here is uh, next to me, at least on the screen, one of the other master teachers. Um, Lee Esther Brooks is also on, as well as uh, Tony Perry. And uh, we're going to be uh, um, going in the order that we were originally given. Well, we're going to be doing presentations by um, Middleton, and then the, uh, um, the Curate undergrad uh, winners, then H.H. Dow, then the Curate grad uh, winner, and then uh, Rich Woodhigh. Uh, remen remember that we have a five minute presentation time with question and answers. If you go a little bit over, uh, no big deal. Just, um, you know, you will get the hook. If, you st if we start going uh, too far, we want to uh, respect everybody's time. Uh, please uh, don't be afraid to put in questions. This is, uh, a lot of the technology is new to us at least to me, and if uh, questions are encouraged, right? Uh, anything you want to add, Doug? No, I think we're good to go. We're excited to see everybody's presentations today. Just have fun and enjoy it. Right, so uh, first up is going to be the uh, Middleton uh, High School Invent Team. Um, Alma, uh, are we good? I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess yes. Um, one of our members is I think as an attendee instead of a panelist. Up oh, and uh, Tony just mentioned that, so we'll. Yes, Anish needs to move over. Yeah. And uh, I would imagine that's probably the one person who's got the slideshow. All right, there we go. All right, we're looking good. So um, uh, whenever you guys are ready, you can go ahead and uh, get started. We'll kind of uh, keep an unofficial, uh, Alma is gonna be keeping an unofficial track of the time. Is this good? Can everyone see my screen? That looks good. Hi everyone, we are the Middleton High School Invent Team and welcome to our Eureka Fest presentation. This past school year, we have been working on developing the Moon Cow Medication Dispenser, an automated medication dispenser for use in senior homes. I'm Preksha Jane. I'm Manish Dunnashaker. Alex Lee couldn't be with us today right now. My name is Mooney Bondu. And Lauren Piacitelli. We are students who recently graduated from the Engineering and Biotechnology Magnet Programs from Middleton High School in Tampa, Florida. We are all interested in the advancements in the STEM field. We are so excited to share with you all today our innovation that we've been working on. I will now be passing it on to Preksha to talk about the need for our innovation. So 16 to 27% of all nursing home residents are victims of medication errors. And this room for error lies in the currently inefficient and very time consuming process for administering medication. There are six hour long med cart runs in addition to three hours of prep time just to organize the pills by patients. So these absurdly long times should be reallocated towards other important tasks. And this problem can be quantified by the concerning nurse to resident ratio in senior homes. So Florida has a staff to resident ratio of one to 20, which means that each nurse has to address the needs of up to 20 senior citizens. And so it becomes a challenge to address all of the patient's daily needs and pretty much impossible to do it well. And the stress along with the inevitable mistakes that come with overwork schedules contributes to many nurses quitting, which leaves even less nurses to take care of the patients. So we took a survey of a small group of nurses and aides working in senior nursing homes in the Tampa Bay area, and 90% of the respondents answered yes or maybe to the possibility of remodeling the current medication administration process. 80% of those respondents answered sometimes or often to feeling overworked or overwhelmed by that daily task. 
So the purpose of our invention is to implement a product that's going to increase caregiver time for patient morale and retention, as well as benefit nursing home residents by effectively eliminating medication administration errors. So reducing the amount of time needed for medicine administration will allow the nurses to maintain previously overlooked hygiene routines and improve the mental health of residents. For our beneficiaries, it's the 2.5 million seniors who reside in nursing homes and assisted living facilities in the US. And it is most appealing to Florida nursing home owners that are already attending to many patients and experience the negative consequences of understaffing. So these customers would value providing the best care possible to their patients and increasing staff retention while maintaining similar profits. The users are primarily the seniors in the nursing homes, but also the nurses who remotely verify medication administration and refill the pill containers every two weeks. I'm now gonna pass it on to Tanu Bandu, who's gonna be talking about existing products on the market and why ours is unique. Currently, there are not any automated medication dispensers that have been designed or sold for use in nursing homes but there are multiple pill dispensers that are on the market for residential use. The two most high-tech and highly reviewed pill dispensers currently on the market are the Medicube on the left and the Hero on the right. Both have fallbacks that prevent legal use of these devices in nursing homes. The most important, which is the lack of verification that the patient actually consumed the medication. Patent with a similar design as the Mooncam medication dispenser is the electronic drug dispenser system, which is designed to address the issue of patients in hospitals having to wait to be approved before taking painkillers. This, invent this invention patent makes it clear that there is a need for inventions that enable self-administration of medication and that cameras are only effective in making sure that medication was taken. The machine is only designed to dispense painkillers and is limited to only a few doses per day. This product may be suitable for administering painkillers in a hospital setting, but by no means can it be used at nursing homes. Our solution, the Mooncow medication dispenser, will be more desirable than current products. Although current products are suitable for residential use, they are not made to meet the criteria and constraints of a nursing home, especially since nursing homes have a legal obligation to provide the additional oversight needed for senior patients. The user interface is intuitive for both senior patients and the nurse. Additionally, while both the Medicube and Hero are highly advanced devices, they cannot be feasibly implemented in nursing homes. Patient rooms usually only have a small nightstand and placing a large device is far from ideal. The Mooncow medication dispenser will be wall mounted. I will now be pass passing it on to Anish Dhanishaker to demonstrate the physical prototype of the device. Our final design takes inspiration from the movement of an open bed 3D printer. By this, I mean that we have decided to have three axis movement by using a motor and lead screw system. This model allows a vacuum for sucking up pills individually from containers to move along three axes and eventually deposit medications one by one to the funnel beside the device's display. The tray of medications gets mounted to carriages on a slide and can be removed for restocking purposes. The brain of our system is a Raspberry Pi, which powers the motors and outputs patient information to the display on the device's front face. As seen above, we have made several major changes to our CAD model after the mid-grant technical review leading up to Eureka Fest. First, we decided to relocate many parts related to the x-axis to the center of the design. This was imperative because of the nature of our device's motion. If the motor driving the x-axis was left off to the side as it was before, the torque of the motor would directly move on one side of the assembly while dragging the other side, introducing inefficiencies and possibly damaging forces into the device. As a result, we moved many x-axis parts to the top of the manipulator, resulting in a more concentrated design. The image on the left shows the state of our CAD model during the mid-grant technical review, and the image on the right illustrates our current final CAD model. After 3D printing a new set of parts to facilitate this design transition, we tested their tolerances as we added them to the prototype. The tolerances worked, it, worked as intended and we were able to attach these parts with minimal issues. 
Here is a CAD animation of our device illustrating its movement and how exactly it goes about administering medications. The frame's visibility was turned off for this an animation to better show our device's internals and how exactly we plan to program our device's axial movement. As you can see, a vacuum assembly mounted to a lead screw will move back and forth and across our device's storage units to pick up the medications one by one and eventually deposit them at the funnel on the right end where our device's user can pick them up. Here is another CAD animation showing how our tray of medications is removable and can be taken from the device to be restocked every couple of weeks. As you can see, our entire storage unit can slide out of the device along with the carriages on the linear slide in order for nurses to restock the different pill containers with a new set of medications every two weeks. This can be done by loosening the screws on the right side of the carriages. As shown above, our device's physical prototype has come a far away from its iteration we presented at the mid-grant technical review in February. We were able to put the full frame together as well as add many more internal components, including the ones mounted to the top of the frame. We have continuously 3D printed new parts to add onto our existing design over the past few months, all of which were necessary in response to the state of our prototype at different stages. I will now be passing it on to Tanu to talk about next steps and acknowledgements. In the coming weeks, we plan to test our invention in a senior home and receive feedback regarding our project. After analyzing and contextualizing the feedback, we'll make final adjustments and finish testing to develop a complete project. The Middleton High School invent team would not have been able to pursue this project if not for the continued support and encouragement from Mr. Scott Mead, Ms. Susan Jurena, and the financial backing and feedback provided from the Lemelson MIT program. Your expertise in design and fabrication and constant inspiration in the classroom in the shop made this opportunity possible. We would like to express gratitude to all individuals who helped this project reach this point in development, including but not limited to our educators, family, friends, and specialists. Thank you for watching our presentation and we hope you enjoy the rest of Eureka Fest. All right, thank you very much. Really, that thank was you. awesome. Thank you, thank you. So uh, now just uh, uh, sorry, uh, just a, qu a quick reminder in regards to the clock. Uh, we're gonna uh, for future presenters, we're gonna go a little. Uh, we'll let you guys go a little bit over, but keep please keep in mind. Uh, right now, we've only got five minutes for questions. I will uh, just to kind of get going. I'll post the first one. What was your original inspiration for this particular project? Uh, yeah, so I can answer this one. Um, what really uh, served as inspiration for this project was uncovering some alarming statistics and sort of recognizing the need for uh, so this type of device. Uh, 16 to 27% of nursing home residents are victims of medication errors. And in the state of Florida, there's a, uh, an alarming staff to resident ratio of one to 20, meaning that nurses have to take care of up to 20 senior residents. And this makes their job very difficult and time consuming and almost impossible to do perfectly. I don't see any questions on the Q and A, uh, but uh, we still have a couple of minutes uh, left for questions. Uh, if anybody wants to, um, so. I'll, throw, right, so. I'll throw one out there to kind of keep things cooking here. Um, so, what was the most frustrating part of uh, designing or fabricating this device? Uh, what was the the hardest moment or part that you had to create and how did you uh, overcome that difficulty uh okay go ahead yeah i can take this question so one of the hardest parts was that all five of us on the team we were all learning from home and we never went to school so it was difficult on coordinating the times for pickup dates and really meeting together to build the device but since we had we really leveraged technology and being able to contact each other to uh, move past this difficulty and 
um, find times when we could assemble and pick up the parts we needed. Great. And there is a there is a question here from Champ Van Cat in the chat in the Q and A chat. Question is, how did you manage to keep your motivation and progress during COVID? Uh, Prakash, you want to answer that one? Yeah. So. We used to, since we weren't going to school, we used to meet up um, at a public library and we used to keep communication nearly every single day. We used to have um, calls and meetings. So we were super excited about it throughout the whole year. And so we also got feedback from our teachers, which were also a huge motivation and inspiration for us. And yeah, we really enjoyed it. Another question came in. How do you manage from John Woner? How do you manage to adjust to different pill sizes? Yeah, so um, when designing this uh, device in CAD software, we conducted research on average pill sizes, and based off of that, um, we actually modeled uh, physical like we actually modeled pills um, in the CAD software, and we designed uh, ten individual containers to put into our device based uh, around that uh, the average pill size and the number of medications as well. That's why we have 10 different um, containers. So our device can hold 10, 10 different medications for up to two weeks. We have and time so, for one more question. Sorry, we, uh, go ahead and finish up and then we have time for one more question. Yeah, so basically the diameter of our vacuum is smaller than the average size pill. So that's why it can accommodate for any size pill. It works on a suction basis. And the last question that we'll be able to get to today is, how easy is it to operate the device? Uh, yeah, so um, everything is automated. So um, once the uh, a nurse puts in a signal or um, the time is up for um, the patient to take their medications, the, the device will go through a system of uh, pre-programmed instructions um, and take up pills that are needed and output them to the user. And the monitor on our device's front face displays information to the user. And there's a camera right above the, the, the depositing area so that the nurse can actually monitor the their patient taking the med medications. All right. Hey, great job, Middleton. Pretty impressive, Mr. Hernandez, huh? It's like you can breathe easy now. All that work is now, that you, you can see the relief on their faces now. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank Excellent you. job. And Mr. Hernandez, who do we have up next? So uh, we've got the uh, Curate undergrad uh, winners. We have uh, Bruce, Michael, and Anson. I'll let them introduce themselves. But uh, this is kind of uh, what our high school folks are uh, aspiring to in their next step in their educational uh, journey, I hope. So uh, take it away, guys. Very great. Thank you. I am going to share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see this. Yep. Okay. Um, Michael, whenever you're ready. Hey everyone, uh, we're Team Minerva. We are the undergraduate team from Johns Hopkins University that won the Lemelson MIT Student Prize in the CARE category for our device that wants to help treat peripheral nerve injury. Uh, I'm Michael Lan, uh, and I actually just recently graduated with a degree in biomedical engineering this past month, and I'm joined by my team members as well. So, hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Bruce Ensman. Um, I'm currently a rising senior at Hopkins studying material science and engineering, and I concentrate in biomaterials. So. Um, hi everyone, my name is Anson. I'm a rising junior, and I study biomedical engineering like Michael, uh, with a focus in imaging and medical devices. So we want to thank you for coming to our presentation today. And we also want to thank the Lemelson MIT program for awarding our device security award, as well as the Eureka Fest for hosting and showcasing all the Lemelson MIT program winners and the student event teams this week. Peripheral nerve injuries have a number of causes, including trauma, cancer, diabetes, and amputation. And when an injured nerve is not adequately repaired, the regenerating axons will frequently form a painful nerve tumor, which is known as a neuroma. And amputations are particularly problematic because during the process, multiple large nerves are severed and left in discontinuity, which invariably results in neuromas. And up to 80% of amputees actually experience this debilitating pain for neuromas that severely affects their quality of life. 
So these neuromas can actually be particularly difficult to treat with most surgical operations and devices failing to actually prevent them from forming. Targeted muscle renovation is one of the first and basically only surgical intervention that has a somewhat proven efficacy, and it involves connecting this very large caliber nerve with a smaller nearby distal nerve branch. So nerve fibers that would otherwise form a neuroma, these are instead redirected to connect with a distal nerve. While the reported outcomes are relatively promising, there's still a pretty high failure rate that's caused by this size mismatch because you have this large caliber injured nerve in a very small target. And so this results in axons that would escape the repair site and still form a neuroma regardless. Our device would be the very first I specifically designed to address this critical size mismatch that's inherent to TMR. So the Innerva conduit device consists of four essential elements, basically. Uh, first, we have our funnel-shaped sheath, and this serves as a physical guide and barrier to prevent axonal escape and neuronal formation. On the sheath, we have diameters of both ends being controlled to basically match the typical diameters of nerve stumps and distal targets. And we also incorporate a crimp wall that allows a conduit to resist kink formation and be highly adaptable for multiple different patients. Suturable extensions are also included at the ends to facilitate suture attachment and simplify the surgical procedure. We also have the nanofiber wall that's made up of an electrosun an electrospun, sorry, nanofiber sheath, and it has an optimized thickness and pore size to help trap infiltrating macrophages, and this helps polarize them to the pro-regenerative phenotype to help reduce inflammation and encourage healing. And the lumen of the funnel conduit is also filled with a hydrogel that has a pore size to facilitate axonal extension for regeneration as well. So like Michael mentioned, the filler or interpenetrating network of the Innerva conduit is made of a nanofiber hydrogel composite that enhances the neuroregeneration and it's incorporated with CSPG. So CSPG is a naturally occurring molecule that has been shown to restrict axon growth through our gel, allowing our device to both promote the tapered growth between the nerve stumps while preventing neuroma formation. The device can be pre-assembled, lyophilized, and maintained at room temperature conditions during storage and shipment making it super easily accessible. We conducted a pilot study in a small animal TMR model for rat sciatic nerve repair using our Innerva conduits. Uh, and our study showed that robust reduction of nerve bundle size and naturally tapered shape of the regenerated axons leading to our target nerve in the neighboring muscle. There was no sign of neuroma formation, and there is also secondary evidence showing a greater degree of guided re to the target muscle. There was no significant difference in gastrocnemius muscle mass between the no injury positive control group and our Innerva CSPG conduit, suggesting effective re -innervation. Our device will provide significant value for the patients, clinicians, and the healthcare system as a whole. And we hope to reduce the cost of pain medication, therapy, and also lost productivity, which is estimated to be a $27,000 cost burden annually for each amputee patient. And we also hope to target the 30% normal recurrence rate that Michael mentioned before um, for TMRs and also the overall 7.8% repeat surgery rate for all amputees. And additionally, our device will make these surgical procedures, TMR specifically, easier for surgeons and also minimize the preventable repeat treatment in the hospital system. Um, and with that, uh, we want to thank you all for listening to our presentation and we are happy to answer any questions. Well, you can tell you guys practice because that was right on the five minute mark. <laughs> uh, uh, one question that I have, is this uh, something that would be placed on a number of nerve endings? Uh, obviously an amputation would have a number of them. So would you just target the larger nerves? So, yes. So oh, go ahead, Michael. You want to go? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, conventionally, after an amputation or uh, whenever we encounter a PNI, there are multiple severed nerves. And conventionally, we actually do multiple TMR treatments, uh, one for each of these severed nerves. Um, so hopefully, our device would uh, serve a similar purpose where we basically implant one of these sort of funnel shaped conduits onto each nerve and then find a distal target nearby that it, it can connect to as well. And it doesn't matter what the uh, distal uh, connection is. Yep. Uh, typically, or I guess by convention, we normally connect it to uh, uh, nerves that lead into muscles, mainly because this allows for uh, enhanced prosthetic use, but there really isn't too much of a concern about what specific nerve we're connecting to, as long as it's an available nerve that we can innervate.
Question from the audience from Hussein Razvi. Uh, what are your next steps for the project? Yeah, that's a great question. Right now, um, we are completing a larger scale of our pilot study. So as Bruce mentioned on his slides, we conducted a pilot study um, for the rats. Uh, right now, we want to really see um, whether or not there's actually a difference between the CSPG and not having the CSPG, which is the axon inhibiting molecule. And then the next step after that is actually moving into large animal studies, um, whether that, that may be pigs or potentially even non-human primates, because that'll be the next step before we can proceed through like the regulatory process, which we've been exploring with different experts um, and going through the FDA to get this approved for market use, hopefully in the next like five to 10 years. Are you, I'm, I'm questioning, I actually have a question for you guys. You're pursuing a patent, yeah? Yeah, we have a provisional patent and we're gonna be filing the utility patent uh, this well, I, I wore this in honor of you guys today then. My patent pending <laughs> t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good job. Thank you. Any, any other questions from the audience out there? They're drumming them up. Well, I can tell you that uh, not, when you're talking about trauma, that's a huge amount of people. When you're talking about accidents, when you're talking about uh, combat injuries, when you're talking about diabetic-led uh, amputations, uh, it's probably something that is not uh, comfortable to talk about as much, but is definitely something that uh, obviously happens. And there, with the huge rise in development of prosthetics, we don't think about what they connect to or how they really interface with, uh, with the human subject, which is probably what you guys how it originally started. Yeah, for sure. Um, one of the great things about why we select TMR as our target procedure for our device to be adaptable to is because TMR is like the gold standard and kind of new procedure that you, there's a lot of videos online that you can compare TMR to other types of like nerve transection and innervation procedures where the amount, uh, the degree of control that the patient can control their prosthetics is completely different. It's night and day. So TMR is really like the future. Um, and that's why we're trying to develop our device for that. You, you received a nice compliment from Aisha Almeida. She says, I don't have a question, but very impressive, uh, especially with all the combat injuries, it's very much needed. So, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, so right now it looks like uh, we're out of uh, time for questions, uh, but uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, move on to our next group. Thanks again, gentlemen, and best of luck in your patent. I'm sure we're gonna be reading about you in the trades. Great job. All right, take care. Thanks. All right, so we're, uh, we're gonna be uh, moving on to uh, HH Dow. So uh, if you guys are ready to go, remember to keep an eye on the clock. We, you will get a kind of a uh, reminder as you're, when the five minutes are up, you can go a little bit over, but uh, go ahead and take it away. Okay, yeah, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. So does this look all right for everyone? Looks good. All right, then yeah, Laura, you can take over. All right, uh, well, hi everyone. We are the HH Dow High School Inman team. Welcome to our Eureka Fest presentation. So it starts off, I'll be introducing who's on our team. So from left to right, there's Alex Kuo, Bobo Cho, uh, Andrew Zhao, myself, Laura Leite, Abigail Ahn, Zoe Angel, and Caleb Cho. Uh, so our team is from Midland, Michigan, which for those of you who are not familiar, uh, is about two hours north of Detroit. Uh, it's a relatively small town of around 40,000 people, but we are lucky in that it, we have a very large STEM influence due to the fact that Midland, Michigan is actually the headquarters for the Dow Chemical Corporation. As such, uh, many of us have shared chemistry classes and science classes, and when the inspiration for our invention, the smart drain cover, took, route, took root, we were able to join a team and seek funding with the Lemos of MIT program, uh, where we did eventually find funding. Yeah, so the purpose of our invention was primarily motivated by my brother and myself's um, experience visiting Taiwan about 10 years ago. During our visit, um, we were bitten over and over again by mosquitoes. I think at one point I had over 10 bites on just one leg. And this coupled with the fact that there was a um, mini outbreak of the dengue fever going on in Taiwan really left a lasting impression in our minds about the dangers posed by mosquitoes and their diseases. 
So when our team was brainstorming problems this year, we did more research into mosquitoes and saw that especially in large urban cities, lots of mosquitoes um, often spawn in the standing water that is found in the storm drainage systems. Um, we spoke to an expert from the CDC and she said, especially in Latin American um, urban cities, there's uh, the specific breed, the Aedes aegypti mosquito that spawns very often in the storm drainage systems. And then these mosquitoes go on to spread their various um, illnesses to the residents of cities. So we saw that if we could invent a smart drain cover that reduces the access of mosquitoes to these sources of standing water in the storm drainage systems, we would greatly reduce the mosquito populations and also the transmission of their diseases. And this um, application of invention can also have an impact here locally in Michigan. Just um, last year, um, Detroit and Grand Rapids had issues with the West Nile virus. And here in Midland, our mosquito control department has to regularly go around and clean out all the catch basins because mosquitoes often spawn in them. So of course, mosquito control is not a new issue and there are many um, technologies and methods in place already. Um, so they fall into three primary categories. The first is chemical barriers like mosquito spraying, um, physical barriers like manhole cover inserts, and th there are also um, bio barriers that are being piloted right now in the Florida Keys. They have released some genetically modified mosquitoes. Um, and our invention is unique to all three of these. It reduces putting these potentially irritating chemicals into the environment. Um, it also is much more versatile than the manhole cover inserts, and it's also um, less controversial than the genetically modified mosquitoes. Yeah, so reduced to practice. Um, okay, so reduced to practice, our invention essentially is a smart drain cover that opens when it's wet, but closes when it's dry. And it performs that consistently despite various variations in humidity or any external factors. And it also does not disrupt water flow or typical drainage patterns of a drainage system. So as you can see in the image on the left, our prototype consists of a high density polyethylene frame. That's the white grating you see on top and attached to each row on the frame is a sulfonated polyethylene, which is a moisture actuated polymer what the sulfonated polyethylene does is it bends downwards when it's exposed to moisture because of its chemical properties. But when there's no moisture around and when it's dry, the polymers bend back up and cover the openings. So this is meant to be a secondary drain cover under an existing um, metal drain cover. So we have made sure that the polymers do not get affected by various external factors like humidity or acidity for experiments. And we've also been doing street testing to confirm that the invention is durable and does not affect the drainage patterns in a city. So on the picture of the right, you can see our prototype under a, a real drain cover. And the fit is not perfect because our prototype was based off a rectangular um, drain cover, but we'll be adapting soon so that we have both um, circular and rectangular prototypes. And um, on this side, you can see at the left video is actually an earlier video of our prototype. It's the first one we made. And what's happening in the video is the prototype is exposed to sprinkling water, which is simulating rain. And as you can see, the polymers bend downwards almost immediately. This video is at real time speed and they expose the openings. And then when the rain drops, the polymers would fold back up and cover the openings. And on the video on the right, this is a video from our actual street test. And it shows how the polymers are bending downwards so that the water is draining and not pooling around that area. And as we continue our street testing in the future, we'll keep on monitoring this closely. One thing we've already learned is we need to use a stronger adhesive to attach the polymers to the high density polyethylene frame so they peel off. But we'll also make sure to keep monitoring whether other parts of it are durable and also if it's disrupting the water drainage patterns. Yeah, so just as Caleb mentioned, we're gonna continue our street testing and um, adapt our uh, smart drain cover to fit many types of drains, not just the rectangular ones. And this also relates to um, adapting our smart drain cover for rural areas that um, collect rainwater in buckets, as this is a primal, uh, prime breeding ground for mosquitoes that spread diseases such as uh, malaria and West Nile virus. Um, to continue with this research, um, we 
also need to secure additional funding. Um, one organization in particular is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as um, they have set aside hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, grants for malaria vaccine, new drugs, but also innovative mosquito control measures. And um, our prototype would fit under this category. So this project would not have been possible without uh, the help of many, many people. First and foremost, the Lemus and MIT program, which obviously gave us a financial means to pursue this um, invention, but also the uh, platform to really uh, just explore inventing and not see it as such a daunting task. Um, also, uh, Audrey Lenhart from the CDC, who consulted with us, Bruce Royce, who helped us with the street testing, Mrs. Abrin, um, who allowed us to present to our fourth grade class about our um, project and also inventing in general. And then of course, uh, Mr. Colvin, our two coach. Thank you. Excellent. All right, uh, nicely done. We have by a, the few, way, a few uh, minutes for questions. Yeah. I Googled uh, the, the list of top, there's a top 12 list of diseases caused by mosquitoes. Uh, and it's amazing. Everything from dengue fever to Zika and uh, you name it. So it's amazing that even though we've known about uh, mosquito borne illnesses, it's, um, I mean, for over a hundred years, we're still battling it. So this is a very, very appropriate. All right, so uh, we've got to, uh, some time for questions. And you can go ahead and stop uh, the share on your screen. Uh, Doug, you might uh, have to sure. uh, ask the first yeah. one. Yep, I'll start the process. Um, so when you were looking at this technology to develop this invention, what technologies did you draw from? What, what things did you look at that already existed that you were inspired by? Yeah, so actually our, um, first we became interested in moisture, actually the polymers, which is what the self-native polyethylene is. When we came across, um, it's actually kind of a toy. It's called fortune telling fish. What fortune telling fish are, are they are like super thin, um, kind of just sheets of, paper, of polymers shaped as fish. And they're made of moisture, actually, the polymers. And what you do is you place the fish on your palm. And depending on which way the fish curls, it like so it's supposed to reveal a fortune. But we were really interested in how this like polymer that made the fish was able to move just upon contacting moisture. It didn't need another motor. It was just because of the chemical properties of the moisture, actually, the polymer that it started moving. So we began, began to think about different scenarios we thought that would be useful to have sort of a polymer that starts moving and adapting when it comes into contact with water. And one of the um, things we thought about was like with a storm drainage cover, we thought that it really did not need to stay open the whole time. We could actually make it so that if the storm drainage cover is only open when it's actually raining using the polymers, then we would restrict the access of um, things such as mosquitoes to the storm drainage cover. So kind of from there, we kind of did more research about storm drainage systems. We did more research about mosquitoes, as I talked about earlier. And we also contacted several experts. In fact, one of them is from MIT. Um, we contacted Professor Robert Langer, who's done lots of work. Um, he wrote a paper about moisture, actually, the polymers a couple of years ago. And we contacted him about our idea. And he also gave us advice about how to develop our moisture, actually, the polymer, which was sulfonated polyethylene. So I think, yeah, this is a project that's been super interesting since this polymer is super cool. And I think it's also really cool how kind of the Robert Langer was so open and just everyone's been so helpful to help us kind of explore this interest and develop our own invention. Great. And we do have a question from Dr. Estabrook. She wants to know what is next for your team and are you considering protecting your intellectual property? And then she did follow up with an exclamation point thing, Robert Langer. She was very excited to see that you communicated with him. Um, but what's next and are you considering any IP? Yeah, so um, I can answer that. Um, we did file a provisional patent um, in May um, and 
kind of, as I touched on briefly before, we really need to do further street testing. Um, as Caleb mentioned, um, the adhesive that we use um, was not durable enough. And there's a lot of external factors that go along with um, being in storm drains that you can't get from a lab um, as much as we've tried to simulate it. So really continue with the street testing continue to work with um, our local cities um, as they've been um, incredibly helpful to us. And then also look at um, adapting this for rural areas since our focus did uh, change to mosquitoes. Um, this is a problem, not just in cities, but also rural area areas, like I mentioned um, with the gathering the water, which is normally left completely open. Um, and this can spread diseases uh, very uh, unfortunately. We have another question from David Mo, which says, uh, when and after what time does the polymer need to be replaced? So what's the lifespan of that polymer? Yeah, this is a very good question that we're also trying to gather more information about with the street testing. So basically, um, the chemical property of the moisture actuated polymer to bend when it comes into contact water, but then go back to normal when it's dry does not go away. This is because through sulfonation, we um, altered the chemical um, functional groups on the surface of the polyethylene such that there are um, polar um, groups on there that kind of give it this property. But we do think that the polymers will need to be replaced once they become torn up um, by the wear and tear from implementation in the street. Obviously there's a lot that goes on above and we try to minimize the sort of damage that's done to the polymers and the prototype as a whole by put, making a secondary drain cover underneath the thick metal drain cover. But we do think that probably after, right now we're guessing two years when the polymer is scratched up or just because um, the adhesive starts coming off, we will need to replace um, the polymers. Okay. I think we have time for maybe one more question, if anybody has one. Um, if not, I'll throw one last one at you, which is what other applications could you see this being used for other than just storm drains? Um, so like I mentioned with the uh, buckets of water that they collect, mm -hmm. that's the one that we're looking at right now. Um, yeah, I'm not, I think that's the biggest one um, because for, they're told to like cover it, but it's a problem since that won't let the water come in. So if right. we can make a so solution that really seals it um, and doesn't let the mosquitoes in, uh, but allows the water to drain through and it closes in enough time, that could be um, very helpful in uh, rural areas that don't have storm drains. Excellent, yeah, I think, I think this actually has a lot of applications and I think you kids have done a fantastic job. You're, you're a great group of inventors. It's fantastic. And it all started with a toy, which is awesome. <laughs> that, that is, that is uh, great to hear. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, you can breathe easy now. And uh, we're going to move on to a uh, presentation for our graduate um, uh, winner from uh, the curate category, Mira. Uh, I'm hoping she is on here. Oh, there she is. All right, cool. So uh, I'll let her introduce herself and uh, go ahead and take it away, Mayor. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, one second, I'll share my screen and get started. All right, can y'all see? Looks good. Awesome. Um, so uh, like Ed said, my name is Mira Mafarge, and I'm a graduate student at Stanford in California, and I received the graduate student prize for the curate category, specifically for developing maternal blood tests to improve prenatal care. And so what I wanted to start with is thinking about today's standard of care. And so when a mom or um, anyone for that matter goes to the doctor, what we begin to think about uh, caring for someone is often after diagnosis. But especially for prenatal complications and um, for many diseases, but for the focus of this work, prenatal complications, this approach is insufficient. Uh, it leads to high maternal mortality rates and fetal mortality rates. And often the only thing that a doctor can do after a condition has been diagnosed is emergency care. 
And so with that in mind, um, what, what we wanted to ask is, uh, are there tools that one can build to fix, to address this? And we also wanted to focus on the fact that the, um, that the healthcare system is imperfect and that this problem is especially acute depending on which segment of the population one looks at. For example, two prominent cases, Beyonce and Serena Williams, um, highlight how uh, prenatal complications affect black mothers at higher rates and they are three to four times more likely to die during childbirth than white mothers. And so with all of this, the way that I think about diagnostics is that it can be a tool that can empower people to seek out the care they need in a timely fashion, as opposed to having to wait for, um, for a later diagnosis and then having to do emergency medical care. The specific tool that I work on is called liquid biopsies, and it looks at cell-free RNA, which is mRNA, like that's included in the COVID vaccine, uh, and statistics. And cell-free RNA is the subset of RNA molecules in plasma, the liquid portion of blood. Altogether, we've developed three tests. The first can predict time to delivery with com com accuracy comparable to ultrasound. Um, the idea here is that ultrasound works best in the first term, but often mothers will not come into the clinic until after the first term. And that's when ultrasound accuracy begins to decrease. And so here, a blood test that can be performed in outpatient settings and settings without an ultrasound machine would provide a comparable um, estimate to that of ultrasound. And the estimate of due date is especially important because that's how a doctor will measure whether a baby is meeting their milestones. The second and third thing are predicting prenatal complications, like risk of preterm birth, where preterm birth is when a mom goes into spontaneous labor um, and then ends up delivering early. It has huge risks for the baby and the mom, uh, both short-term mortality and longer-term health consequences like cerebral palsy. So if one can predict this early, then that would provide the mom and, babe, the mom and doctor with time to prepare by uh, potentially using certain uh, treatments to speed up lung development for the baby or delay delivery for the mom. Or in the case where a mom lives far away from a neonatal intensive care unit, it would provide her time to, um, to come to a hospital with the appropriate care to ensure the baby and the mom's survival. And so here we can predict risk of preterm birth up to almost two months in advance of delivery. And this is something that affects one in 10 mothers worldwide. The third is to predict risk of preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is a prenatal complication that is characterized by high blood pressure and end organ damage, typically to the liver and the lungs. And here we can predict it in the first term, whereas it's usually diagnosed and symptoms begin to show up in the third term. It affects one in 20 mothers worldwide. It's what Serena Williams and Beyonce had. And right now there is no real care for it if it's diagnosed uh, in the third term other than uh, monitoring the mom's condition and then uh, having her deliver if her symptoms become worse. And often it's a trade-off between is the baby developed enough to survive outside the womb and how bad are the mom's symptoms. However, if one can predict it in the first term, then doctors can prescribe a drug like low-dose aspirin, which reduces one's risk of ever developing the syndrome. So in all of these cases, these tools empower mothers to take, care, take their health care into their own hands in a system that is imperfect. We can think of diagnostics and predictive tools as um, objective evidence in a world where subjective symptoms sometimes does not lead to the care one needs. For example, the early signs of preeclampsia are headache and nausea, which can typically be thought of as general pregnancy discomfort. However, with a tool like this, then one could say, oh, uh, this mother's at risk of preeclampsia, and um, as a result, we need to monitor her more closely. Um, I also wanted to talk about the process of inventing. Uh, oftentimes, when uh, these presentations happen, and I've so enjoyed listening to the other inventors uh, talk about their work, we hear the end result, which uh, looks like this pretty picture, and it's very exciting, but uh, the process of science 
in my experience and that of many people I've worked with is that it's incremental, that oftentimes there are a lot of days when things don't work. And uh, all together, each day, you fix something small, and eventually that leads to, can lead to an invention. Here, these inventions um, form two provisional patents, and that's really exciting. But when I think about the process, I think about each day, and there are days when I was pretty, uh, I was struggling, for example, as part of this work to extract the cell-free RNA from blood samples. I developed a robotic system and nine times out of 10 when developing it, the robot would crash. And then I would have to figure out why it crashed and fix it. Um, but more, I would, more so than being confident in knowing everything, because I don't know everything, I was confident in my ability to learn. And that would be what I think is most important, being confident in your ability to learn and to problem solve because there's so much to learn and that's really exciting. And when you're working on research, you're working on this boundary of what is known and what is unknown, like we talked about in the welcome discussion or for engineering, what is possible and impossible. And so that's really hard work. And oftentimes it's going to lead to failures, but slowly you'll learn a lot and you, I appreciate those little wins and, uh, I am really excited about what we've developed here because it will hopefully empower mothers to take care of their health and change prenatal outcomes, leading to healthier babies and healthier moms. Amazing. I, don't, uh, I can't claim to be anywhere near an expert on this thing. Uh, so that, that's awesome. Uh, I'll start with the first question is, uh, so I would imagine this would be a simple blood test and how soon in the pregnancy can a mother um, get it? Yeah. Um, so that's correct. It's a simple blood test tape that uses a mother's blood sample. So um, we are currently working on preclinical validation. Uh, this work has been licensed. The patents have been licensed by a startup called Mirby who is working on preclinical validation. And we expect these tests to be in the clinic in the coming years. And what would be the cost associated? Mm. Uh, have you thought about that? Because uh, yeah. obviously, any any medical procedure, that's the second <laughs> the second that's thing that comes to That mind. was going to be my question: was how much? <laughs> how yeah. Much? Um, so these tests rely on a relatively inexpensive technology known as qPCR because they're looking at a small number of gene measurements. And so, when thinking about uh, diagnostics and whether or not they will be covered by insurance for the first part and how expensive they are. Um, first, the covered by insurance part. Uh, insurance companies already have a code to cover tests like this. And so practically, it would just be a doctor would say, like, here is the code, and then the insurance company would reimburse it. And in terms of cost, current tests that are on the market, for example, to predict um, whether a baby has Down syndrome or not, cost on the order of thousands of dollars because of the technology used. These would cost more on the order of hundreds of dollars or a little less than hundred dollars, depending on how many genes are measured. And they'd be covered by insurance so for the patient, no cost. And considering how much it costs to raise a child, it's a no-brainer. All right, uh, so we got a little bit of time uh, for questions. Uh, you can go ahead and either put them in the chat or in the Q&A. And Oh, here's one here from Dr. Esther Brooks. Uh, who inspired uh, Mira when she was in school? Oh, lots of people. Um, so when I was in high school, uh, I thought I wanted to be an English major. I thought science and math were fields where um, the answer was always known, that two plus two equals four, and that's what we were going to be doing in college, science and math as well. And uh, my biology teacher, Ms. Vandeveld, uh, showed me that that was not the case, that there was a lot that was unknown, and that science and math can be a lot like English is. One is thinking about, um, you know, how does data form a story, and are we convinced that the data we see, even when we don't know the answer, um, like we don't know exactly what the answer is, is compelling enough to create something, for example, like a liquid biopsy test. Um, and then in college, I had a scientific mentor, a few, Dr. Laufenberger at MIT. I went to MIT for undergrad and uh, Dr. Hughes, who was the person I worked with from day to day. And um, they both taught me how to pipette, how to code. I didn't know how to do either of those when I came to college um, and had patience with me when I didn't know when things would work or not and inspired me to do awesome science. Um, one of the stories Dr. Hughes likes to tell is that 
The first time I sent off these precious samples for a sequencing experiment, which is an expensive experiment. I didn't know that the little tubes we use have caps. So I sent it without a cap and the sample evaporated. And uh, she sent me an email the next day being like, hey, did you cap the tubes? But learning is, you know, sometimes making those small mistakes and going on. I just didn't realize they had caps, but that doesn't mean that you can't learn and move on. And uh, yeah, they've all, there's been plenty of inspiring people. There's also been my parents, my grandparents, my friends. Yeah. I love that you mentioned that you know how to learn. Uh, one thing that I learned when I was, that I realized when I graduated from college is that I really didn't know very much, but I had learned how to learn. And that was probably my biggest uh, takeaway from college. Exactly. I completely agree. Very good. All right, any, uh, any other questions? We've got a couple of minutes left. I think your, um, pre your presentation was so well done that you answered all the questions <laughs> before they could be asked. Thank you. What would be, what would be the time frame that you're looking at in order for this to kind of um, go on to clinical trials and uh, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Preclinical trials are ongoing right now at uh, a startup that licensed the technology and um, the hope is that once those, should those uh, validate the results that we've seen so far, that the tests would be available in the coming years. But one of the goals of preclinical trials is to make sure that the results that we have found in our work apply for racially and ethnically diverse populations with different risk factors during pregnancy. So some moms can be at risk for preterm birth, others are not. And the key in all of these tests is that um, we are not telling moms who are not at risk to, we're not putting their sending sig signaling uh, that they should be worried and we are identifying moms who are at risk. So those statistics and making sure they're in line with um, what we believe them to be and what is important clinically is really important in the preclinical trials. Well done, well done. Thank you. We have one last quick question then we got to close up. Uh, how long does the test take? Yeah, um, the blood sample itself, drawing it is a few minutes. And then uh, there are a few different modalities one can envision. Uh, there could be a, a box that one would have in the clinic, and then the doctor would uh, isolate the blood plasma, the liquid portion of the blood, and run the test in the clinic, or one could send it to a central facility. And uh, depending on which modality ends up being the one that's used in the clinic, then it could take, it would probably, in all cases, it would take no longer than a few days. In some, it might take a few hours. That's fantastic. That is super quick. Thank you very much, Mira, very much. Of course, thank you all for listening. All right, so we've got uh, one more presentation. Uh, this is uh, from Ridgewood High School. And if you are, Set to go, you can go ahead and turn your cameras on and uh, show your screen when ready. Take it away, folks. All right, hello everybody. My name is Patrick Mulder and I'm the project manager of our Ridgewood High School Invent team from Ridgewood, New Jersey. We are so excited to be with all of you guys today to celebrate your inventions as well as ours. I'm joined by my teammates, seniors Matthew Mulder, Ashley Hamilton, Karina Trauma, and David Zang, juniors Haley Haglid, Teddy Stevens, Emily Truskowski, Claire Wallachie, and David Moe, and sophomore Elliot Ewell. The RHS Invent team invents a three-in-one solar aquatech or SAT water bottle. What this provides bacteria, virus, chemical, and heavy metal free water, all in one solar panel bottle that requires no chemicals, leaves no chemicals, and is completely sustainable. The three-in-one SAT water bottle is one that combines three technologies. Number one, and at the heart of the invention, is the innovative, naturally green, self-sanitizing power of hydrogen peroxide, which provides on-demand action from just water, oxygen, and sunlight. 
The second is a UVC LED, which provides auxiliary sanitation and removes residual H2O2. And lastly and thirdly, a pre-filter that removes harmful chemicals and heavy metals. Now, we have a video to show you a little bit of how it works, and Claire, if you could take it away. So we apologize that there was no sound. There's some cheerful music behind it, um, but I think you guys get the right idea. So let's move forward. And Matthew, why did we want to invent this three-in-one SAT bottle? One in three people worldwide do not have access to safe drinking water. Safe drinking water is not only a problem in impoverished countries, but also in places where ordinary clean water supply is disrupted, as we've witnessed in Flint, Michigan, Newark, New Jersey, and Texas recently leaving millions without portable water. The desire for clean water is so universal that some 1 million single-use water-filled plastic bottles are bought worldwide every single minute. With the 450-year life cycle, single-use water bottles are an ecological nightmare. Also, our Solar Aquatech survey shows that 80% of the 63 avid hikers, one of our focus beneficiaries, are dissatisfied with their current disinfection method and would likely embrace our new innovative approach. And here is that approach. A three-in-one SAT water bottle with UVC LED and a pre-filter to meet the design criteria for a practical point of use. It can sanitize water in 30 minutes in a regular stainless steel 24 ounce bottle powered by a solar rechargeable battery. And it is the only multi-technology bought water bottle on the market at a competitive price of a single technology bottle. Therefore, it is a unique entry into the $31 billion water purification industry. But just how did we accomplish this, Emily? Well, we are fortunate enough to have Professor Shu Hu of Yale University, Dr. Michael Lebowski, and Ridgewood Water, our local water department, as our mentors. They helped us reach our goal first to develop an effective electrode system incorporating Professor Hu's hydrogen peroxide catalysts to produce sanitizing levels of hydrogen peroxide in 24 ounces of water in just 30 minutes. How did we accomplish this goal? Well, the electrode system has been primarily concentrated on the heart of our invention. The electrode design went through three main stages of development. The first, cylindrical, second, planar sandwich, and thirdly, mesh sandwich. We improved each stage by increasing circulation and mass transport, in addition to increasing active catalyst surface area. After some 100 experimental runs and many 3D printed revisions, we achieved a 450 fold improvement of hydrogen peroxide production. Is the electrode system good enough to sanitize water? To find out, the final version of the electrode system was then tested at the Ridgewood Water Laboratory which is NJDEP certified to meet EPA and NSF protocols and standards. Ridgewood performs tests to recover total coliform and E. coli bacteria that the World Health Organization designated as waterborne pathogen indicators. In our first bacteria test, we treated home aquarium water. We submitted the raw aquarium water and three samples treated by Solar Aquatech for 15, 30, and 60 minutes to Ridgewood water. While the raw aquarium water was found to be contaminated, all three solar aquatech treated samples were total coliform bacteria free. Since the raw aquarium water did not have E. coli, we repeated the test with water from the Diamond Brook, which is a stream that runs next to our football field at the high school. And as it turned out, this raw water source had both coliform and E. coli. The subsequent certified tests showed that all three SAT treated samples were coliform and E. coli free 
even the 15 minute sample. These bacteria tests validated the solar aquatech method. So Haley, how did we fit it into a bottle? So we designed a bottle cap chassis that anchors the electrode to its bottom. Aside from the cap, there's also a stirrer which oxygenates the water and circulates it through the electrode. The stirrer is directly attached to a nine volt DC motor, which hangs out the, top, the bottom of the cap chassis. The cap also houses the circuit, the brain of our invention to control all of the components. The circuit had to be small enough to fit inside the bottle cap along with the components. A solar rechargeable battery is used to power the electrodes, the DC motor, uh, and also the start button, the two indicator lights, and the UVC LED. We first let the dirty water pass in through the activated carbon and ion exchange resin to remove harmful chemicals and heavy metals before the water enters the bottle through the dirty inlet port. The sanitizing cycle is then started by the consumer by the push of a button. A red indicator light will instantaneously turn on to show that the water sanitization process has started, but is not yet safe to drink. 30 minutes later, a green indicator light will turn on to show that the water is safe to drink through the drinking port. Our three-in-one SAT bottle is finally complete. We will continue to work with our mentors to address the bottle's durability, sustainability, and marketability. We will also continue to spread invention culture throughout school-wide and community engagement. Finally, we will explore the application of Sola Aqua Tech in larger water treatment facilities. We want to thank the alumnus at MIT program, Mr. Perry, Ms. Lundenberg, Ms. Mirren, Dr. Eastbrooks, and Dr. Couch. In addition, we also want to thank our mentors, Professor Shuhu of Yale University, Dr. Michael Lebowski, and Mr. Calby and Mr. Ferrier of Ridgewood Water, as well as our school leaders, Dr. Gorman, Mrs. Brogan, and Mayor Nunson, Mrs. Edmondson, and the entire Ridgewood community. And lastly, and most importantly, we want to thank our advisors, Dr. Lebowski and Mr. Warner. Now, Elliot, could you please show everybody our bottle? I have with me our final prototype, our three-in-one 24-ounce solar Aquatech water bottle. As you can see, we have our 3D printed holder holding the mesh sandwich electrode in the front. We also have our stirrer, which as mentioned before, oxygenates the water. With the filter attached, our solar Aquatech bottle can fully sanitize water. All right, I'm guessing that was that was it. That's uh, awesome. And just when I thought there were no more inventions regarding water treatment and water bottles, uh, here comes another one. Uh, so I'm amazed at the fact that you're taking existing technology that probably otherwise we wouldn't have thought about using it and still managed to squeeze it into a bottle. Was that uh, what imagine the uh, steel part? Was that from a standard um, water bottle you guys had and then a 3D printed to attach to it? Exactly. Uh, and uh, what's the uh, capacity? The bottle is uh, 700 milliliters itself but with the uh, electrode hanging into it, as well as the um, stirrer, it holds around 600 milliliters of water. And for those of us that uh, use the um, uh, Imperial system, how many ounces is that? It's 24 ounces. <laughs> All right. Uh, All right. And our first question from the audience is from Eva Caboni. If the solar power runs out, will it warn you if it is not working fully. So the solar panel isn't uh, our only power source. It's a nine volt rechargeable battery that uses um, the power source of the sun to recharge itself. You can also recharge it with a USB, <clears throat> but just for more sustainability, there's also the solar panel option. Um, so if you uh, happen to be running out of power and you're afraid of that, you could charge it via just your regular USB port. Um, and then also um, we were thinking about for future adaptations to uh, have a little screen to show you how much the battery is charged or maybe an indicator light 
to show that the battery is charged. Okay, great. And I'll just throw in a follow up on that is, uh, have you tested or what is the runtime of uh, a fully charged nine volt? I'm glad you asked. Um, so in my tests with the circuit board, uh, of course, this is not fully um, answering the question because uh, this was only the test with the circuit board, a mock electrode and the nine volt motor. Uh, but so essentially it should be about five runs. Uh, each runs about 30 minutes. So you can do them um, sure, like about, yeah, about two hours and 30 minutes of runtime in total. Great. Thank you. Any other questions from our audience? You can put them into the chat or the Q&A. I'll, I'll, I'll throw out the inevitable. How much? How much? How much? Um, so we still have many prototyping refinements to make, um, but right now our, we expect it to be uh, $105 to $120, um, which is uh, competitive with uh, LARQ and Crazy Cap, which are $104 to $118. Um, by far, our most expensive component is the titanium mesh and UVC LED. And we're optimistic that uh, with wholesale buying and um, with mass production that these costs will decrease. We, we do have a question from the audience. Uh, they said, great job. This is from uh, Richard Calby. Does the disinfection process affect the temperature of the water? That is a great question and we have not really um, gone to that. We can definitely look into that with further research. Okay, fair enough. Um, Ted Stevens wants to know what's the water taste like after you treat it? So we have actually not taste tested the water yet. We know that our treated water is total coal from an E. coli free and certified by Ridgewood Water. However, for any human subject research, we need to obtain IRB approval. And additionally, most sanitizing water bottles in the market are not NSF or EPA certified as our bottle is. That's a good answer, because if you were my students, I don't think I'd have you drinking out of a river either. Um, but there was one question in the chat. Yeah. Uh, have you tested how effective this is with heavy metals such as lead ions that were impacting the uh, Flint, Michigan water supply? Uh, so that is the purpose of the pre-filter is in order to remove those heavy metals that could damage the filter. So the pre-filter system will work to remove those non-organic damaging uh, elemental compounds. Great. One last question from Mark Padilla. How much does the whole device weigh? So they're thinking about hiking with this thing. How much does it weigh? Emily's uh, reaction was, good question. So the um, bottle itself, the stainless steel part of the bottle, as you saw in um, what I showed you, weighs about uh, three fourths of a pound. But then the, uh, the top of the cap, which is um, the electrode with the cap, adds about a pound of weight because you have a nine volt battery and then also um, a nine volt DC motor. So it's about two pounds without water in it. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, team. Mr. Hernandez, I'll let you take it from here. So that is the end of our presentations. So uh, all of that hard work. Uh, so congratulations. Uh, yeah, virtual uh, hand claps. Uh, good job. This is uh, this is hopefully a taste of what's to come, right? So we, we hope to see a bunch of you as part of our uh, graduate and um, undergraduate prize winners, or even uh, on the MIT campus uh, one of these days, who knows? So uh, good luck uh, to all of you. Thank you very much for uh, all the hard work and for doing such an amazing job. I know that we've all kind of uh, developed a love-hate relationship with Zoom meetings, but I think this is as good as it gets. This was fantastic. I, I mentioned earlier in the chat, every everybody that presented today came well prepared and presented on Zoom, which is not easy. You, you made it look easy, but it's not. Very well done. All right. And yeah, we had a, uh, we had a one point over 80 uh, people on the call, which is 
pretty darn cool. Uh, this is it would have been more than what we ever had in person, because uh, typically, well, gosh, yeah, we don't have uh, that much space in some of these rooms. So this is uh, this is very close to what we'd have had in person. Amazing. Very good. Very good. All right, I think uh, I think that wraps up everything for us, unless uh, Alma or uh, or Kathy, if you had anything else to. Uh, Okay, say, Alma says good. all set to say goodbye. All right, thank you very much, <laughs> Great folks. Good job, everyone. Well done, everybody. Right, take care. Bye now.